guys, so I'm here today to tell you to get ready. Buckle your seatbelts because we're probably at a point now where the instrumentation is going to get a little difficult. And the analysis of the data that comes from the instrumentation is going to be difficult as well. Because we are getting ready to start this whole field of something that we call mass spectrometry. And you're probably thinking, well, how difficult can it be? We've already went through tons of different spectra photometers, right? So we've talked about UV so far. We've talked about infrared. And we've talked about the AAAE. And you're probably thinking, well, all of these have things in common. So if it's anything like these, no big deal. We've already been trained on it all semester. All right, well, here's the deal. These three instruments had something very in common. They had a bulb, a light bulb in the UV, carbon rod, which is basically a radiation bulb in the infrared, and we had light bulbs in the AA and the AE section. And these bulbs directed energy or a light beam at a sample, and these samples began to absorb that energy. And we didn't have as much to come through out the other end. And on this side we have a detector. And that detector measures the difference and it reports that difference in terms of absorption. UV directed a beam at a sample in a cuvette. The detector gave you absorbance. Infrared directed a radiation source at a sample. It absorbed it measured the signal in terms of transmission. AAAE directed a bulb at a sample. It absorbed in a flame. And the detector told me how much went away. Mass spectroscopy, though, it is a spectroscopic instrument. Or spectrophotometric instrument. The problem is that it doesn't really have a light bulb and it doesn't really look at absorbance and the detector is not really looking at how much light is getting absorbed. This thing operates on a completely different level. It is related to spectroscopy, but is it truly a spectrophotometer? Photo well, that's something that we're going to find out. But that's what this lecture is going to be about, right? So we're going to take a look at mass spectrometry that we are going to abbreviate as MS. And we're going to talk about this MS feature that can be attached to many different instruments. Because in the beginning, mass spectroscopy was a standalone instrument. The problem is that this standalone instrument, it had its hands tied. It really did the best on pure compounds. And we could only inject pure compounds on it. Now, you know as good as well as I do, how many times can we have an actual pure compound in the laboratory? It's just not going to happen, right? We're always going to have a mixture. We're always going to have an unknown sample that's submitted for analysis. So the MS field didn't take off as well as what they thought it would in the very beginning because we had to have a standalone instrument that would run pure compounds. Now, the MS is really looked at as an attachment, no longer as a standalone instrument. And it's typically attached to another piece of equipment that will do the separating. Because without that, the MS cannot do its job effectively. So the power of the MS is going to rely on the separation technique that takes place before it enters into the mass spectrometer. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of history lesson. Okay? We're going to talk about how the MS came about. We're going to talk about maybe the few uh, key roles, key scientists that played uh, a discovery aspect of this instrument. And then we will slowly move on into the theory of how this instrument works and why it does its job the best way. So with that said, the first thing that I want to talk about here is a proton. Now, whenever we discuss protons in a laboratory 
or in chemistry or in any type of science for that matter, a proton is basically a hydrogen. And if you take a look at a hydrogen on the periodic table, you're going to see that hydrogen is listed with one proton and it's listed with one electron. And you take the atomic mass and subtract the atomic number and you get zero neutrons, right? Typically, this is like a 1.01 down here at the bottom with the atomic number of one. The subtraction of these two numbers give me neutron numbers. So one minus one is basically zero. So hydrogen is very simplistic. There's not too much in it. Well, a proton is even simpler. A proton is a positively charged hydrogen. We've seen proton, especially when we've talked about acids and bases. So what that means is that it doesn't have a neutron, and this positive charge means that it's lost an electron. Well, it only had one to begin with, so whoop, there it goes. And now we're only left with one proton, and that is it. You can't get simpler than that. So that's what we call H plus a proton because that's simply what it is. It's just a proton that's left over, nothing more. So in the early 19th century, we're talking like the 1800s here, many believed, many scientists in a laboratory believed that the atomic weights that you see on the periodic table today were whole numbers. And these whole numbers were based off of hydrogen. The reason is because they thought, well, if hydrogen's the simplest and everything is based off of the foundation of hydrogen, and if we just have one proton and that is it, then everything should be in multiples of the proton weight. We should have whole numbers, we should never have fractions of a number, and if it's not exactly whole number, then this is probably like a calculation that needed to be rounded off, or something small and trivial that we're missing that we just don't know yet, but no big deal. The problem, though, is that we begin to look at compounds that were easily studied during that time, one of which was chlorine. And chlorine had an atomic weight of 35.45. So the question is, how? How did that not have a whole number for atomic weight? If everything is based off of hydrogen, which is a proton, and we get chlorine, and it's 35 times greater, why isn't it just 35.00? Or something close to it, we would have been okay with 34.96 or 35.05, but 35.45, that's like smack dab in the middle. How could this even exist? Well, this whole theory was thrown out of the water. Other people were doing studies during the time, and what they were finding is that chlorine was not the only one that violated this rule. We had other atoms, we had other elements on the chart that didn't quite have a whole number assigned to their atomic weight. They were too heavy to just simply round off to make it even. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit. With this concept in mind, we come across a guy named J.J. Thompson. Now, you probably heard of Thompson's name before in a general chemistry class, or at least I hope that you did. And what Thompson was focused on was something called the cathode ray studies. So let's kind of dig back into our filing cabinet a little bit and think about what the cathode ray studies were all about. Well, during the time of Thompson, what they discovered is that they could take something like a lot bulb that we would call maybe a cathode tube and we would have a light beam to go through the tube from one end and out the other. And this light beam was studied. It was all with just electricity in mind. That's really all that this was geared around. What is electricity? How can we harness it? What's it made up of? 
any special properties about electricity that we need to know. I mean, again, we're talking about the early 1900s here. So, of course, all of these questions are things that we would take for granted today. But what they discovered is that they could place something like a magnet up on top of this light beam. And this magnet would begin to change the shape of the beam. And this beam would kind of be pulled toward the magnet. Well, that was very evident to Thompson on what was going on. If we're introducing a magnet to this cathode ray, and this cathode ray is directed and pulled toward this magnet, then this light beam, this energy beam, has to have a charge. And what he discovered is that this magnet, well, this was a positively charged magnet. So that led them to believe that electricity maybe was negatively charged. Well, if we take a look at the components of the atom, we're talking about protons and we're talking about electrons and we're talking about neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. They don't have a charge. Electrons are the negative piece. So all of a sudden, can we assume that this light beam, this energy beam, because it's negatively charged, is that representation of electrons? Now, Thompson did more than that. So what Thompson decided to do was to go through and specifically study neon. Again, very easy gas to get a hold of, easy to study, very stable. This is part of the noble gas family, right? That's what you learned in general chemistry. Again, I hope you did. And what he did, he's directed this neon light beam, if you want to think of it that way, toward a power source. And he measured basically the refraction or deflection. I guess that would be a better word, a deflection pattern. What he discovered is that this was more like a parabola that he was getting. It was very wide. And with a fine tooth adjustments, what he discovered is that this wide deflection pattern was actually composed of two different ones. Both neon only neon involved, neon gets deflected, but neon does not get deflected in the same way. For some reason, this neon, when it deflects, begins to split up. It's like a ricocheting bullet. Think of it that way, at least. That could be a good analogy. We have a bullet that's being basically directed at some type of metal. And let's say that that bullet hits and ricochets off. Well, common sense would tell us that once that bullet hits, it's going to ricochet off in one direction. Whatever direction that might be, who knows, but it's going to go in one direction. But that's not what Thompson discovered. What he actually saw with his studies is that when this deflection, this ricochet pattern happened, we would get kind of two bullets coming off. So people begin to scratch their head. Why was this going on? Well, if we fast forward a little bit, what they will discover is that this ricocheting, this two different paths as it deflects, was representative of two different neons, not just one. One of the neons is neon 20. The other one is neon 22, a little bit fatter, a little bit heavier. Well, whenever we talk about fat little atoms in a general chemistry class, we have a word for that, and that's called an isotope. And an isotope is basically an atom with different weights. 
Now, if I go back to a general chemistry class, hopefully what you've learned is that the weights of the atom comes from one specific thing. The weights of the atom will come from neutrons and it will come from protons. Electrons don't weigh anything at all. Super, 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 super tiny. We just ignore them. We just say zero. Even though they're not zero, we say zero. So the atom with the different weights mean that this atom has to have a different number of protons or different number of neutrons. If that's what contributes to the weight of the atom. The problem is that this is neon. And in order for it to be neon, then the same number of protons have to be there. If we change the proton number, we change the identity of the atom itself. We cannot have that. So the isotope, if we want to clean up that definition, it is an atom with different weights. But more importantly, it is an atom with different neutron numbers. They can't be different protons. If it is, then it's a different atom, and that is not the definition of an isotope. An isotope is representative of one atom. That atom has a different weight. It can't be contributed to electrons because they weigh so little. It can't be contributed to the protons because that changes the identity of the atom itself. So the only thing is left is neutron number. And this is where we get the whole concept of isotopes. Now, what did Thompson actually see? It's kind of impressive. Here you go. This is Thompson's study. And he took away all of that information from this black and white, fuzzy, hazy picture with smears that are all over it. And what you're seeing down here is the representation of the NE20 and the NE22. Now, there are other things that he kind of observed. There are other things that were present that he was recording at the time. But this is kind of what started it. And you can see the year right here, 1913. The Parabolus of Neon is how this image is titled. So what they're seeing is this kind of ricocheting that's happening right here. And it's not just kind of a straight line path. We get this very wide path. And over a course of time, they actually contribute this to different weights of neon that are ricocheting off. So one bullet kind of is made up of two different bullets that we did not know were present when we shot that bullet in the very first place. All right? So that is what Thompson discovered. And that was the image that was uh, being used back in his time to determine the presence of these things that we call isotopes. All right, so that's where I'm going to end this video. Uh, we're going to pick this up. In the next video, we're going to continue on with some of the other men, and they all were kind of men at the time, that contributed to the field of mass spectroscopy. And we're going to talk about what each one of them discovered and how this layer kept building upon itself. So there's your discovery of the um, Neon 20 and the Neon 22. And before I let you go, we talked about these cathode rays, right? So let's take a look at what a cathode ray is actually. And here's just a quick Google search of this cathode ray, which is, start, which is what started this whole concept in the beginning in the first place. So here we see the magnet up here at the very top. This magnet is polarized, meaning it's either positive or negative. And then here is the light beam that comes through the tube. And as the magnet kind of scours the surface of the tube, well, you can kind of see a deflection. You can kind of see these electrons getting deflected away from the magnet in this case. And because of that, that's going to be a negative magnet that they're using to push it away. Now, there's tons of different kind of pictures that you're going to see there. Uh, some people actually have these cathode rays in their lab just to demonstrate kind of a, a basic concept or principle of what light is and the basics of electrons and negative charges and how uh, these magnets can, can play a role. Uh, here's another picture of the same type of thing, cathode ray going through, a magnet on top begins to bend it. 
So this is the first kind of concept of charges being present and what electrons are. And then as we go a little bit further with Thompson studies, we get across the neon studies, which show that isotopes are present as well. All right. So that's where this video is going to stop and come back and we'll talk about our next grandfather in the sciences.